Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Good afternoon, and welcome to this special edition of Libertarian Counterpoint Podcast. Uh, we're coming at you on October 9th, 2020, right in the heart of uh, election season. And uh, this is going to be a special uh, inter- uh, show where we interview uh, a candidate for public office. Uh, but uh, first, I'm going to introduce our panel to you. Uh, in our upper right-hand corner, we have uh, Leon the Word Brathwaite, last word in liberty. He is a retired engineer from the state of California. In our lower right-hand corner, we have Tim Everett, our screaming eagle of freedom. He is a uh, pilot in the state of California. <clears throat> and joining us today uh, in our left, uh, lower left-hand corner will be James Just. He is a candidate running for California Assembly District 7. Uh, So we can't wait to hear what he has to say about some of that. Uh, But uh, before we get to that, my name is Jason McPhee. I'll be your host. And uh, (coughs) uh, thank you for joining us today on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcast. So let's get right into it. James, um, (coughs) uh, you are running for the uh, 7th District of uh, 7th uh, California Assembly District in California. Um, did you want to tell us a little bit about yourself so the voters can kind of get a sense of who you are? Uh, you know, you California native, um, you know, uh, what are some of the things you're interested in? Yeah, I was born and raised here in California, here in Sacramento. I went to graduated John F. Kennedy High School and I attended, what, a year at Consumers River College and then spent most of my time kind of doing everything from running assembly lines to uh, working in warehouses, washing dishes. I've kind of done all the, the work average people do that make this, you know, our, our society work. And, you know, during this time, I spent a lot of time in self-education. I was lucky. I had a, my family had a strong roots in education. My stepfather was a teacher, a science teacher at, at uh, Luther Burbank High School. And he was also a researcher out at UC Davis. And he had a friend who happened to be a stereotypical absent-minded professor. And so I got to spend lots of times in a philosophical discussion about science and using the scientific process to self-educate yourself. And so I was not a good student at school, but I loved learning. And so he actually taught me how to do that on my own for myself. And so I was actually able to graduate high school on time with what might be a record low attendance rate of like 48%. And so, <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> yeah. Okay. You can't do that today. He would not allow you to do that today. Right, but I was I didn't cause trouble and I passed my classes more or yeah. less. And so it's you know, they allowed you to do that back then. They didn't force I had an anxiety disorder which was not known. You know, you didn't know about anxiety disorders back in the in the eighties, in the seventies right. and eighties. So we didn't know that 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 school environment was bad for me. But we know that today, and yet we're still forcing kids to that school environment. And well, James, you, you know, that, that's one of those things where I think it's kind of interesting because I didn't know this about you before, but I, I, you know, I also had a similar experience near the end of high school where I also didn't attend a lot in my senior year of high school, but I finished, uh, they had night school courses and other things, and I finished up about the same time. But yeah, maybe that's a kind of an indictment about the school system, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you get back to, back to your... Well, no, it's, it's actually, that's a good, good thing to bring up because the schools are... Uh are a big issue right now because with coronavirus and distance learning we're actually trying to find out that you know a lot of kids need different things to be best educated we've seen kids who you thought maybe would have i've seen parents who thought maybe their kids should be homeschooled or do distance learning but when their schools were taken away they said no my kid needs to go in school he thrives in that school environment but i've also seen other parents who were very big on the reg- traditional school environment, they saw their child come home and completely thrive, become a whole different student under the distance learning environment. And so you're going, now, if we were smart, we'd take a look at this and say, okay, we need a more flexible educational environment. Indeed. We need an environment that works yeah. for the individual student, not for the system. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the thing when I went through school. That was my biggest education in going through school was that the system cares more about the system than they care about the children. And I'm not saying that the teachers care more about the system than the children. That's not what I'm saying. The system, the bureaucracy, the politicians, they care more about the system than they do about the individual child. And we, and you can understand back 100 years ago when information was expensive and slow, why we created a system like this. But now where, where information is essentially free and it's and fast, there's no reason that we should be stuck in a education system that's not flexible enough to meet kids like me who have anxiety disorders or or have 
you know, issues where they need to be in school. We can have this flexibility. Like I struggle with things like algebra. And so I need in, in school instruction for that. I need an actual instructor, but you know, history, science, a lot of these things I can do on my own. And so we need to have a, a flexible education system. And so if there's anything of why I'm running is that we have such a simplistic mindset. I call it a command and control mindset in the, in the, edu in the po political system these days that it's kind of destroying our culture. It, it, we're, we're, we are taking a one size fits all approach and imposing it on all of society. You know, James. James, that, I mean, what, you, what you're saying is a uh, is a really good point, in as, especially given our current situation. But in terms of the overall, in terms of the overall system of how education is designed here in the United States, well, let's let's stick to California for the time being. What do you feel about school choice and and charter schools um, and giving parents more choice and flexibility in terms of where to send their children to be educated. How, how do you feel about that, given that you're running for the legislature right now? Well, school choice is very important. I mean, if you can't choose where, <clears throat> where your child goes to get an education or what type of education you want your child, then somebody else is doing that. And you have that fundamental right to make that decision for your, your children. But if our charter school system is simply a carbon copy of the public school system, we're, we're going to end up in the same spot. So we have to completely rethink about how we deliver. You know, choice isn't, if it's a false choice, then it's not real cho really a choice. If you're showing a public school system or a charter school system that simply looks the same with different employment rules, then you're not going to get a different result fundamentally. We have to completely rethink about how we structure education. Our schools should become community resource centers that have a small school attached for, for people who go there who need that in-person education. But for others who need it for a class or for two, they can go there and use it. These things should be open almost 24 hours because our our society is no longer a nine to five society. I mean, I was, as a janitor, I would work three different jobs over the course of a day. And and so, you know, a nine to five school didn't work for me. My It would have been better for us if my kids would have gone to school at like 11 o'clock, <laughs> in, in, in you know, in the morning. And I could have picked them up at nine o'clock in the evening. That would have been my school day. That would have been my work day. And so, but our schools don't work like that. Our schools work for the system, not for the parents and not for the students. And so if we really want to help working class people, we need to make our schools more flexible so it works for them. But not just, not just on the education, but on the time. It and sounds like, like you're really open to having comp competition in schools, essentially what you're really after, that and not a top-down command and control, but, you know, let, let a thousand flowers bloom, I guess. Yeah, yeah I don't like, I think we use the, the competition is probably the wrong word. I think I know what we mean by that, but I want experimentation. I want people to be allowed to experiment on how there's best to educate their children. And yes, the cream will rise to the top, and we view that as competition, but it's not really competition. No one's competing. We all want our children to be educated. That's the goal. No one's competing for that. We just want to figure out the best way to educate the individual child. Okay. Fair enough. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it, it is clear that the, the, um, the, the, the government always comes up with these one, one size fits all, and then they mandate it to everyone, and it, it never works. So, so I can see your, your, the way you have, you have articulated your position in terms, of, in terms of more flexibility rather than competition per se. I could understand the, the concept you're articulating here. Yeah, well, and the problem with mandates <clears throat> is that they come with punishments rather than support. It's, I was working with a water district, just a water district, and they had a change in, there's a change in how we are forcing uh, some of these rural departments to change how they uh, pay for water, how you pay for water. They're forcing you to go on a meter system, which is okay, fine. But they're also changing things like how we, how they measure chromium in water. And I looked at this, okay, it makes sense. We wanted to measure it more sophisticated. But in, rather than saying, okay, here, we want you to measure this differently, here's some support, here's how you do it, and here's how we're going to help you communicate this change to your customers, they just mandated to change. They said, if you don't hit this change, we're going to punish you for it. And by the way, we're not going to give you any help helping you communicate why this change is important to your customers. Okay. And so, so the customers come to me and says, hey, this, our water district is, is kind of behaving badly. 
And I go look at it. It says, no, they're not. They're being forced to do something by the state. It's actually not unreasonable, but, but no one gave them support to, to transfer this knowledge to you. And so now you're mad at the water district rather than mad at the, at the assembly where you should be mad. And so we get mad at the wrong people. And so it's built this level of distrust. And so now no one trusts anybody anymore. Well, you know, I, I guess uh, given, you know, your, your uh, background, you know, and, and your exposure to education and also, you know, in this distrust, you know, issue that you, you know, brought up with government, what, what, are, are these some of the issues that have brought you, got you interested in politics or are there other interested? What, what led you into politics? Well, oddly enough, when I was decided to run for office, I actually tried two years ago, the party, the Libertarian Party asked me to try and run, do a late minute run for office kind of the same way I did it this year. And I said, yeah, sure, kind of being naive. <laughs> and we didn't actually make, we didn't make our signatures, but it was a great learning experience. And so when political operatives started to talk to me about, I guess it was about a year ago now, I decided, no, I don't want to do it. They have their own motivations, right? Political people have their own motivations. The party cares about the party. Um, other political operatives cared about, you know, making other people spend political money. They didn't care about me or my issues. But what happened this year is I was coming home from actually recording a, an episode of the TV show Counterpoint and buying soda and milk. And a fellow gig worker says, what are you guys going to do about AB5? And I didn't have a good answer for them. And so after about a week of not being able to sleep well, I decided, well, I can actually do something. I can go find somebody to run for office. Nobody else was trying to run for this seat. Nobody else even tried. And so I, so I went and I looked. I went to Republicans and I looked, I went to Independents and I looked, I went to all the Libertarians I knew who are politically intrigued, interested to see anybody want to do it, and they didn't want to do it. They either didn't want to put up with the, with the campaign finance laws, it's too complicated, they didn't want to learn, or they didn't want to, you know, have a political fight and lose, because in this district it's half Democrat and anybody who's not a Democrat has a long, hard road. Well, well, speaking of the district, maybe now is a good time to share with our viewers an image of what the district is that we're talking about. We're talking about Assembly District 7, and so that essentially is a big portion of uh, Sacramento uh, County. Uh, James, did you want to uh, elaborate at all uh, about the specific yeah, areas it covers? It covers a lot of Sacramento <laughs> County, downtown Sacramento, some of the outline. It doesn't hit any of the suburbs, but kind of the Sacramento the major Sacramento, it gets real into Alberta area. So it gets a little bit of rules and it gets the kind of the downtown West Sacramento area as well. And out 50 to about, what is it? About Watt Avenue. And then it gets a bunch of weird, uh, I don't know, as you can see, there's a bunch of weird coves and cuts and <laughs> a gerrymandered. Some of those gerrymandered lines actually make sense and other ones don't. You know how these kind of political works. But it's mostly Sacramento, city of Sacramento. Um, I think there's, what is it, Rancho Cordova, Rio Linda, Alberta. There's a handful of other communities involved, but it's yeah. largely Sacramento. But when, when most people think Sacramento, this is what they're thinking, essentially, the district yeah. that you're running it's for. It's the Sacramento yeah. metropolitan area. Um, right. Center city. It doesn't get to Elk Grove to the south. It gets to, what, about Fruit Ridge Road, but maybe a little farther in some areas. And a little less farther, but yeah, it's kind of the major city, and well, you a little know, bit north, as you can so see. That, it goes a little bit north to the rural areas, up into the farmlands. And... So, James, given the um, our current situation, which is, of course, the pandemic, and I mean, you got quite a lot of territory to cover in District Seven. How are you? How is your campaign managing this now? What, what are you doing different, I guess, than you would have done if there was no pandemic? Well, our original plan was to do community center meetings. We were just going to rent community center meet for halls, rooms, once a week, once every two weeks, however we could afford, and have community meetings. And we haven't been able to do that because community centers have been closed. So our, we essentially just switched everything to virtual. We decided to essentially run a Facebook campaign and add it with a kind of an old school. We went back old school to, to a whisper campaign. We just we're asking people to simply talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, and say, hey, just go check them out. We're, we're not doing a hard sell. I'm not doing traditional campaigning because, frankly, I would have lost anyway. And so I get to do something that is completely different. I get to be open and honest and completely transparent in a way that other people, other uh, candidates don't get to be. 
and we're just going to let the chips fall where they may. Seems like a mask might uh, actually interfere with a whispering campaign. <laughs> For James. And yeah, well, hey, maybe it'll help. You know, maybe it'll help. People can whisper a little better. It doesn't the, the voice doesn't travel so far. You can just whisper in your neighbor's ear. <laughs> but the 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 going back to the pandemic, we've had, you know, I live in a my my community I live in is a high person of color community and it's been hit hard by the Ooh. pandemic and so not just from a health perspective from an economic perspective a lot of this low economic workers unless you're a you know stocking shelves or like my my daughter does you know you if you're a bartender or a waitress you've had a very difficult last six months and yeah. so that's a large group of people in my district and when we look at some place like sweden who had the same data we did, made different choices early on, and everybody kind of vilified them, but now they've gone through it. You look at videos and pictures from Sweden, and they're eating at restaurants like normal. They don't even mm -hmm. put masks on on buses, which, quite frankly, I would suggest you wear a mask if you go on public transportation, you know, sure. but Sweden doesn't even do that. And so, and yet they are through this. They now have a lower death rate than the United States. They now have a lower infection rate than their neighbors in Europe. and and a lower death rate than most of them. And so it's, you know, you can understand the panic. I actually don't want to misjudge people for the panic because early on we had bad data and we didn't know. And I, so I can understand the panic, but there's no reason to continue on this draconian uh, approach to the COVID situation. We need to get back, let Californians, give them the data they need so they can get back to their lives. Well, I, I mean, I have always made the case that we, we, we you know, take precautions but we do not need to lock down the economy to do this. I mean, the social distancing, we wear the mask. When we come home, we wash our hands and probably take off our clothes if we want to do that. That's fine. But take the precautions, but not the lockdown. And that the lockdown have been punishing. And so many people, and that is one of the causes of the pandemic that nobody's talking about. Everybody wants to talk about the deaths, but nobody wants to talk about the other cause that is associated with the pandemic. But I don't want to digress too much because we well, are. That's just a good about. thing to bring up, Leon. Um, French President Macron, they asked him if he was going to lock down again, and he said no because the, the collateral damage was too high. So, there you go. So, so there are people who realize that, you know, between the mental health crisis that comes by from people being locked down, I saw a story today about, about a uh, protest in, at a retirement, what is it, a nursing home in Colorado that they said they're, the residents were saying they'd rather die of COVID than loneliness. And yeah. so there's this, they're taking a, the emotional toll that this is taking on people has not been considered by the leadership. And, yeah, the, and not just the emotional control, but the emotional toll, but the societal and cultural toll. Yes. We, we're, we are starting to hate each other because, oh, that person's not wearing a mask. We've become, it's... It's becoming toxic. Our politics was toxic enough, and now it's kind of seeping into our daily lives, and I find it very distressing. Well, you know, this highlights the fact that we all have different different values, and and it, it poses different risks on each of us as well. So this one size fits all solution is is really, you know, just it's quite an imposition. But I didn't want to. Uh, we're we're getting uh, a little bit late in the show, and I didn't want to uh, lose too much time for you. I'm talking about a few issues that. Are important to you for District Seven? If you wanted to focus on a couple issues for us, uh, what, what what would you like to talk about? Well, our our single biggest issue is why I'm here, and that's the the disastrous consequences of AB five, and we have to find a way to get around it. Um, the biggest problem with that was the lack of transparency. It essentially happened without gig workers having an input. It was all done because unions who represent less than nine percent of non government workers in the state of California have undue influence. And a lot of people complain about money in politics, but you know you can solve that money in politics problems by voting for people who don't get it. I've deliberately not asked for money from even my own political party. I was talking to our, our chair at an event the other day. She says, we were surprised. You didn't ask us for money. And my response to her was, I found a way to run for office without needing it. But kind of the real answer is, if I ask them for money, then I become like every other politician. And so I'm not going to ask them for money. If they want to give me money because they support my cause, great, I'll take it. But I'm not going to ask for it. 
because if you ask these big money donors, whether it's your party, whether it's the traditional big money donors, they view that as an investment and they want something for it. And things like AB5 happen because of that. And so the mm. only way to circumvent that is to circumvent it. Why do you suppose Prop 22 uh, had so many added things to it uh, instead of just being a repeal of AB5, which to, to my thinking would have been a simpler and more effective tool for um, bringing the most, uh, well, everything that gig workers had in the, in the past would have uh, brought it back with just the repeal of what took it away. So why do you suppose uh, Prop 22 is, is so much more than just a repeal of AB5? Well, because Prop 22, which I, while I support Prop 22, I wish we didn't need it. Because quite frankly, I figure Prop 22 is like cutting one leg off, but AB5 is like cutting both your legs off. I'm not, as a gig worker, as someone who is driven for Uber and Lyft and, and does app-based gig worker, I don't like either solution. But 22 is better than AB5, so I'll take it. But the reason they, it's, it's an Uber and Lyft bill, and they were simply trying to save their own business model. You can't, you know, they're the ones who are investing in, the, in getting it put on the ballot. They're the ones who are investing the money in, in doing all the marketing. So they're going to arrange it in a way that suits them. Yeah. yeah. Trying, to, trying to find a way to do what the 300 and what is it, 310 now different industries that have been affected by AB5. It, it's probably too much to ask of Uber and Lyft and DoorDash to, to kind of pull that together. It's it's political realities. And and for our for our listeners, I just wanted to clarify: AB five was mainly uh, developed in the state legislature, and it was focused on Lyft and Uber initially. You know, to try and uh, but it but it hit everybody. Well, and was, look, yeah. the uh, they used Uber and Lyft as the excuse. Yeah, and, and they hit everybody. It was just cover. It's really it's the SEIU and the Teamsters wanted to get in on the on on era industries that they don't have a foot in the door in and this is a way to force people to join unions it's with dynamic with the oh well, i forget the name of the decision that made it so state workers and other people don't the have janice, to the janice, decision. janice decision this is all a result of janice this is just yeah. the side effect of janice and because the whole dynamics decision was based on one guy who worked 15 hours as an independent contractor for a trucking company it didn't even have it the dynamics decision didn't even have anything to do with uber and lyft but the Supreme Court, the California Supreme Court, literally wrote law. They made up this test, the, the ABC test, all on their own. And, and then so the courts, the legislature, rather than telling the courts to take a hike, you, you don't get to write law, they, in, they encodified that law. They in, encodified that court decision into the law, and it's been disastrous. Well, and, and to be honest, uh, you know, in this time of COVID, where we have literally crushed so many jobs, I can't think of a better way for the economy to get back on its feet than making it easy for people to go and work somewhere, you know, to not have exactly. a lot of restrictions on them. And, you know, so I, good, I hope for the best for you in your effort to try and uh, get rid of this terrible law here. It's, it's suspect the art communities, the community arts have been the, actually been the hardest hit. Again, it's, it's back, the cultural, the cultural destruction is actually going to be worse than the economic destruction. It's true. It is, yes. Because the small, the small theater groups and the small community groups and the small groups that, you know, for artists and musicians, those are going to be go away or at least be greatly reduced. And so those are, you know, those are where people, those are training grounds for, for people or, or those are fulfillment for people. And so, you know, you're just taking so much away and they didn't even think about it, which is the really the most disturbing part. Well, the legislature, the legislature never think about anything. They just want to put forward the agenda, and the rest yeah. of us have to live with the crap. And an insanely simplistic mindset is really a problem these, we are having these days. Yes. Uh, well, and it's yeah, it's myopic. Uh, it's it's focused on one thing at the exclusion of all others. Like, not to bring it back to uh, COVID thing, but this this. Uh, this damn the torpedoes full speed ahead 100% effort being focused on a single uh, virus uh, is is myopic and and we're seeing the results now. Yeah, of, it's all. dangerous. Yeah, target yeah, fixation is dangerous. It, it yeah, makes you lose situation. Yeah, awareness. exactly, and that's what it is. Target fixation. Yeah. Okay, and so but but back 
Well, it's near the end of our show, uh, and uh, you know it's been it's been a great show so far. But we like to wrap up with something kind of crazy in the uh, uh, political realm or, or in the public that somebody has said. And so recently, uh, they had, we just got through the uh, vice presidential debates that occurred on uh, Thursday night, or was it Thursday or what? Well, it occurred earlier this week, anyways. And uh, it was something happened near the end of the debate. It was actually much more interesting debate than the first one <laughs> between the presidential candidates. But uh, near the end, Mike Pence, who has very white hair, uh, had a fly land on his hair. <laughs> and it was so apparent because <laughs> his hair almost looks like painted on white hair. <laughs> so you couldn't uh, not help but notice. But one of the interesting things, uh, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about it. And so uh, CBS this morning uh, host Gail King said something kind of odd about the fly landing on, on Mike Pence's head. And she said, uh, at one point, when they were uh, talking about uh, systemic racism, I think it's very interesting timing that a fly would land on Mike Pence's head at that particular time when he, uh, he had said there really wasn't systemic racism. Um, I saw the fly basically going, say what? I mean, it was very interesting. Uh, that was... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to call that highlight, uh, but that was certainly a memorable moment. So it just kind of an odd thing, you know. Always something about race going on in these things. But... So flies speak English now. Is apparently. So... It's, it's, it's... I didn't know flies could speak English. That's I learned something. Yeah, about you, yes. oh, I, yeah. I didn't watch the debates, but I did have a response to the response of the debates. You know, I said, "Well, Team Blue." I, you know, I was watching the response from my timelines. And, you know, everybody who's a de who's kind of on Team Blue saw Blue, Camilla Harris won. Everybody on Team Red said Pence won. And everybody else was talking about a fly. And, <laughs> and so I figured the that's about won. as interesting as the debate was. Yeah, the fly won, definitely. I, well, yeah, this, I goes along, this goes along with Mother Nature uh, being angry yeah, and know. causing fires and and. Uh, hurricanes because uh, Trump is in office uh, so a fly is part of mother nature don't you know that the fly is landing on top of Pence's head to whisper in his ear you know whatever you're saying is wrong you wrong. dumb Republican <laughs> you could always I mean Gail King you know you could always talk um, come to these liberal elites to talk their crap you know and it's always about race Race is always the selling point. They're going to save us, you know. They're going to save all of us. We so-called people of color who need their help. We could always count on these people. So please, Gail King, continue. All will do nothing but re-elect Donald Trump. That's all they're going to do. Okay. Well, our politics clearly has some bugs in it. But uh, uh, with that said, <laughs> well, uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. And uh, we wish the best of luck to James. Uh, as the yes. Comes on the, yes. Uh, election. It will yes. be on, Good I luck, James. Good luck, yeah, James. We wish you yeah. all the best. Go so, for it. Uh, go yes. and uh, we certainly endorse James uh, uh, wholeheartedly on this show. So thank Indeed. you, James. Yeah, in full disclosure, I'm your director, so you know you guys yeah. kind of have to be nice to me. When 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 the show ends, we'll tell you what you really think. <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs>